What makes a great Souls-like great? A lot of devs have asked that question in the years since Dark Souls changed the gaming landscape forever, but few, be they AAA or indie, have found a truly satisfactory answer. Outside the games made by From Software themselves, you can count on one hand the titles that truly set themselves apart as worthy contenders to the Elden Throne. Neo, Lies of P, Salt and Sanctuary, Remnant, blasphemous. Depending on how you count Hollow Knight, you could maybe raise a second hand, but now, thanks to a humble little hermit crab and the tiny indie team that made him, there's no more need to quibble about it. Another crab's treasure is decidedly different from other titans of the genre, designed to be an approachable first Souls-like for those who have yet to get good, while still offering the sort of meaty challenges that inevitably hook all lifelong fans of the genre. And that philosophy is reflected in its aesthetics and tone. Bright, cartoony, and packed with puns, the game invites you to dive into a colorful underwater world full of hidden danger and mystery, but also teeming with life. Among the corrupted, dead civilizations, the obligatory poison swamp, and the vast sands between, our little hero Krill finds a thriving, trash-trading society of mostly friendly, funny little fish guys. Well, thriving for the time being anyway, with crustacean robber barons and tax-hungry monarchs sucking the life out of the ocean, and bottom feeders eager to step over as many little guys as it takes to find their place on the rapidly ascending ladder, collapse is closer than anyone seems to realize. Through Krill's fresh eyes, drawn out of his comfy little tide pool hermitage into the open ocean after a literal loan shark repossesses his shell, you'll see the rot setting in a little clearer than most. But that doesn't mean you can do much about it, even if you can kick a lot of shell on the way to taking back your mobile home. This is an undeniably funny game with a sharp, satirical edge, but the story itself is no joke. Which is an important distinction. Too often, parody games refuse to take themselves or their world seriously, which makes it all but impossible for the player to take them seriously either. And lack of investment is poison, real swampy poison, in a genre about getting good and dying trying. You have to really care to get into a Souls-like, and this game makes you care. This is a world living in the blissful ignorance of the pre-apocalypse, which sets it apart from the dark, mid, or post-apocalyptic tales that tend to dominate the genre. But make no mistake, the inevitable end looms over this cozy little world just as much as it does over Lordran, The Lands Between, or Ashina. In fact, narratively speaking, Sekiro is probably the closest point of comparison in FromSoft's catalog at least, to the anti crabitalist parable that Agro Crab Games have put together, what with its still kinda functioning bastions of NPC society and the decaying old kingdom that the story eventually brings its hero to. Or at least it resembles the first half of Sekiro. Another crab's treasure leaves a few more days of breathing room before the true end, which I hope we'll get to see explored in a sequel. That hope doesn't seem too unreal reasonable in light of the game's modest commercial and critical success so far, and more importantly, the success of its combat design, which is the other area where it's most comparable to Sekiro. Like FromSoft's best game, Fight Me, this one eschews the conventional stamina meter in favor of a posture bar that rewards you for parrying and pressuring your enemies rather than weaving in and out of range, and opts to balance all its encounters around a single weapon the player needs needs to master, in this case a fork rather than a sword, providing playstyle variety instead through powerful, limited-use secondary tools. Also like Sekiro, it gives you a grappling hook, which I think we can all agree is something that could improve literally any video game. Krill's Hermit Crab equivalent to Sekiro's Shinobi tools are found, fittingly, in the shells lying around the ocean floor, which double, appropriately, as shields and, in keeping with the story's theme of pollution, aren't really shells at all. Until he gets his natural home back from that lone shark, the poor little hermit crab is forced to put on trash cast down by the humans far above, alongside the microplastics that fuel the crab economy and the petroleum 
uranium-based gunk that's polluting crab mines and turning them into senselessly violent video game enemies. From pop cans to solo cups, disco balls to N64 carts, Krill can don a very nice variety of shells, exactly 69 in total, each with its own defense rating, a weight class ranging from small to large, which determines how fat your rolls will be, and possibly additional buffs to Krill's other stats. Plus, each one comes with a different shell spell that Krill can invoke by drawing on the ancient and mysterious magical energy known only as umami to gain a variety of advantages in battle, from projectile damage to temporary invincibility to healing over time. You can also equip up to three stowaways, like barnacles or anemones to your shell to further increase Krill's stats and gain other benefits like increased stagger damage or a light to guide you through the deeper, darker parts of the ocean. But you can't rely on any one of those abilities for too long because each shell also has its own health bar independent from Krill's, which depletes a little each time you take damage and a lot whenever you block without landing a perfect parry. When it runs out, the shell breaks, your stowaways deactivate, and you've got to scramble around looking for another one, which can easily get you killed in the heat of a boss fight or even just dealing with regular mobs. The grappling hook comes in real handy in those moments, since in addition to hooking your foes for stagger damage, it can be used to yank shells in from across the map. Though aiming it's easier said than done when a big scary samurai crab is chasing you around a sunken sushi boat with his chopstick katana. Beating certain bosses also unlocks powerful adaptation spells that you can use to further even the playing field with or without a shell equipped. And by beating a certain semi-hidden boss, you can even upgrade those adaptations with umami crystals, the same collectible currency that you use to buy extra skills like parrying or sticking your fork in a second shell to use it as a hammer. The creature and environment designs are where this game really shines and sets itself apart from almost every other Souls wannabe, even the ones with substantially bigger budgets. The bright natural beauty of its Battle for Bikini Bottom-esque underwater setting tainted by a crustacean scale parody of human civilization built from our discarded milk bottles and pizza boxes facilitates some truly inspired art direction that continues to surprise and delight throughout Another Crab Treasure's 20-ish hour runtime. And that ends up supporting some surprisingly solid world building, which manages to play with very Souls-like ideas of lost civilizations and ancient secrets older than living memory, while still keeping its tongue planted firmly, but not too firmly in its cheek. After all, living memory for most shellfish is like 10 to 15 years tops. With 18 different bosses in the game and a solid range of regular enemies and mini bosses to contend with in between them, it also keeps the surprises coming in combat. Enemy animations are, for the most part, well-designed and well-telegraphed to facilitate the intricate dance of hit and hurt boxes that makes this genre so compelling. The tracking on some attacks can be a tad bullshit, while others aren't nearly bullshit enough to challenge a decently skilled player, but on the whole, it strikes the right balance between toughness and fairness, and Souls veterans can, of course, impose a bit more challenge on themselves if they need it by building for a higher risk-reward playstyle and using suboptimal shells. At least, to a point. Personally, I found the game to be at its most fun and challenging around the midsection, when I was battling the aforementioned Crab Samurai with so little health I died in two hits, and later taking on Pagarus, the powerful world boss who restricts exploration of the Sands Between Sandbox area out of sequence. After banking all the microplastics I earned from those fights and picking up some of the Zelda-esque health and damage boosting collectibles in that newly explorable map, though, the rest of the game was 
a bit of a cakewalk with every other boss falling in like one or two tries. It left me wishing there was just one more optional boss in the last area that could really give a maxed out Krill who's found everything something to do with all the power he's collected. Though to Agro Crab's credit, I did still get got more than a few times outside the boss fights thanks to some truly devious level and encounter design. And to be fair, it was my own darn completionist habits that led to me outpacing the power curve of the bosses, unlocking every skill and upgrading every adaptation to the point of overpoweredness well before the end game. If I really wanted to, I also could have respect once I realized my resistance focused min-maxing had left me with an effectively unbreakable shell and hammer, which adds stagger to attacks that a lot of enemies and even some bosses can't deal with. I didn't because on some level I was still very much enjoying the power trip of stomping powerful bosses on my first try, but in retrospect I know I would have had more fun properly learning their patterns and taking them head on the way I did with my glass cannon build against the mid-game bosses. This is, of course, the danger inherent to designing a Souls-like with too many in-game options to lower the challenge, or indeed, the dreaded easy mode, both of which are present in another crab's treasure. It's only natural, after all, to take the path of least resistance when it's available, so most players will subconsciously lean toward options that remove friction from their play experience when they find them, even if that ultimately robs them of the satisfaction that the best souls likes out there so consistently provide. Even with my self-imposed restrictions, restriction of never using assist mode, aside from giving Krill a gun to snag the last two achievements, I still ended up diluting much of the fun in my endgame by telling myself that all this power was my reward for exploring thoroughly and seeing the path to a strong build early on. The less chances the player is given to raise their own power level relative to their enemies, either in-game or in the menu, the more tightly the designer can tune the experience toward that inimitably satisfying feeling of getting over or through a wall they once thought insurmountable. Of course, the flip side of that is that the seeming insurmountability of those walls stops a lot of folks from even trying to get past them in the first place. Many players will never experience the indescribable joy of proving you can do it in Souls or Sekiro or Bloodborne simply because those games and the communities around them create such a convincing impression that you simply can't. That's not true. Anyone can learn to get good at any FromSoft game with patience and a willingness to embrace failure, but I know a lot of people find that very hard to believe, and Another Crab's Treasure just might be the game that convinces them otherwise. It has that easy mode right there after all, so it doesn't seem that intimidating, but it explicitly encourages players not to use it, and offers plenty of in-game options to ensure that most won't have to, so long as they explore somewhat thoroughly and seek out challenges they can manage when they do hit one of those walls. And in doing so, it's poised to give them their first taste of the essential addictive joy, the secret ingredient underneath the art direction and combat tuning that makes all of the truly great souls likes great. The joy of learning through failure. <laughs> And what makes it 
really special is it can still provide that same joy even to a Souls veteran. Something that most games which try to emulate FromSoft's classics, even the beautifully polished ones with otherwise exceptional level and encounter design and balls hard bosses, fail to deliver by copying too much of FromSoft's design ethos and game feel. Because once you do get good enough at dodge rolling and stamina management or parrying and possible your breaking, as the case may be, no other game that asks you to do those things will ever give you quite the same first-time experience that Sekiro and Dark Souls did. Yet with its shell system, Another Crab's Treasure is able to explore a design space the Souls series proper long ago abandoned, because shields breed passivity, and push players to learn a new, different rhythm of combat from anything they're used to. One where medium and heavy builds are in some ways more viable than light ones, all while giving players who aren't used to any of it their first taste of iframes and committed attack animations and all that other soulsy goodness we can't get enough of. That said, vets who've previously gotten... gitten? sufficiently good can just dodge roll through pretty much anything. The game's built around different play styles and its exaggerated cartoony animation makes the timing pretty easy to read, but that doesn't take away from how rewarding it feels to master the shell system and parry and grappling hook so you can stay up in foes' faces and play the game the way it wants to be played. Thanks to that, Another Crab's Treasure is able to fill an essential niche in the Souls-like ecosystem that's been so sorely missing up to this point. A game that newbies can comfortably cut their teeth on, yet hardcore players can still appreciate for its distinct aesthetic and design. If I had to score the game for Metacritic or whatever, accounting for technical jankiness and flaws in the presentation, which the small team are currently working on patching out, plus a few moments of genuine bullshit in the design and the balance issues toward the back half, where if I have a suggestion, I'd say maybe add some scaling to the levels so that past, say, 15, you don't get quite as much power for putting a point into a specific stat. It's just my opinion, though. I'd probably give it like an 8 out of 10, but it's not like most of the great Souls-likes are jank or bullshit free either. And like those games, the fun and satisfaction of the full experience on offer here is worth so much more than the sum of its parts. I firmly believe Another Crab's Treasure is something that anyone with either a passion for or passing interest in this genre should try. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It's been... Gosh, years since I last wrote up a video game review like this, but I felt the itch and just sort of banged the script out in six or so hours. Feels good knowing I can still do that almost a decade after I last committed games journalism. I would very much like to do more, if possible, but like with the Bang Brave Bang Bravern and the Scott Pilgrim quickie reviews, my ability to do so depends largely on you. If this is the sort of thing you enjoy seeing from me, please consider liking, commenting, and of course, of course, subscribing to Basement Life, all that good algorithmic jazz. And most importantly, if you're financially able, contributing to our Patreon gives me and Yazzie the budget to pay our editors for these riskier, smaller videos that aren't guaranteed to recoup the cost of production. At any rate, thanks for watching and for at least thinking about doing all that other stuff I asked. If you'll excuse me, now that I'm done with this game about digging through real trash, I gotta get back to the anime kind. I'll see you on the main channel at Shea Garbage.